on the 19th of December, Global Citizen uh, would be honoring a lot of individuals in the Global Citizen Prize Awards, which would be hosted by John Legend. Among the recipients uh, for the Global Citizen Country Hero Award is Dr. Oluwashon Ayodeji Asowabi. I hope I didn't murder that name. Uh, she is the Executive Director of Stand to End Rape Initiative. Hello, Doc, how are you doing? I'm actually not a doctor, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I can get my doctorate degree soon, but my name is Oluwa Sheo. I did your show of it and it's great to be here. Fantastic. So what has being nominated and or winning this prize mean to you? Being nominated has, has been the highlight of my year. Um, and it's because of course, Global Citizen is one organization you always look up to. You, I've been to one of their concerts um, where they awarded the 2018, I think, Youth um, Award winner. And I was like, oh, wow, this is such a great platform, you know, um, to, to get recognized by. So it was just like a passive thing in my mind. But to now become a winner myself, um, it's, it feels really great. Uh, but importantly, it's, you know, highlighting the work that I do um, and sharing that with a global stage, which is very important for me. So um, I'm really excited about it. Fantastic. And talking about the work you do, tell us a bit about your initiative, how it started uh, and even why it started. Um, so it's called Stand to End Rip Initiative STAIR, like most people call it. Um, it's an NGO based in Nigeria. And what we do is a lot of work around um, eliminating sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria with, through policy advocacy, um, awareness, um, engagement um, and direct support to survivors. And I started this at a time where, you know, there was a death of available resources for survivors in Nigeria. In fact, death was even like the extreme of the spectrum. It was even difficult for you to come forward to say I have been raped. That was even the major problem, the culture of silence um, and victimization. So I decided, you know, to um, just, I mean, it's bad enough to, to get violated, but it's worse for you to die in silence. Um, so I started writing about, you know, sexual violence and trying to change people's opinion and perceptions about survivors. Um, and the more I wrote, the more people were like, oh, wow, I never thought about it this way. Or somebody would say, oh, so this happened to me, but I didn't know it was rape. So... That's, that's really how I started. And it has grown since 2014. A lot of young people, you know, joined in um, wanting to be a part of the movement, to contribute. Um, and the more we expanded, the more our work grew. So we started doing a lot of work around policies. How can we ensure that the rights of women and girls are enshrined in not just our constitution, but the policies that we use day by day. And then we went to the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill that was thrown out of time. Then we went to the Sexual Harassment Bill, uh, which recently passed that year. In. And a lot of our work actually um, right now is community engagement and support. That's how the journey began. And it's been six amazing years now. Great. And particularly in, say, the last 12 or so months, the world, world has watched uh, a lot of call by Nigerians uh, to end rape, uh, to end a lot of these related issues. Do you see uh, progress being made in terms of awareness, one, and also in terms of perhaps the law and when people report, do they get the justice they, they, they need? What is the state like? Um, I would say we've made a lot of progress. Um, I mean, coming from a place where you couldn't even talk about sexual violence to where you can now talk about it and you know, demand accountability. We've come a long way. And in the past one year, I mean, I have been a part of some advocacies um, and I'd like to you know, spotlight one, which is like the state of emergency GBV. It's like a coalition of about nine organizations in Nigeria that are you know, working to, Ensure that the Violence Against Persons Prohibition you know, Act is adopted by the states. Um, we have shelters, we have sexual assault referral centers, and what have you. And I would say it has achieved you know, um, a considerable amount of success because due to the advocacy, you had you know, the governor's forum declaring a state of emergency. 
on rape in Nigeria, which means, you know, um, government needs to look inwards to see what is not working in terms of their policies or what policy they have not adopted or, you know, how they can be more intentional with budgeting for issues around women's rights and women's safety um, in Nigeria. So I would say we've achieved a couple of success because we've had more reports. I mean, COVID even made it worse where we recorded over 3000 cases in the space of four months um, in 2020 alone. Um, so we've had you know, more awareness around reporting with cases and getting support. But the prosecution on the other hand um, is not fast enough. It's not prompt um, 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 for survivors. It's not prompt for we service providers um, because it takes a lot of energy for us to keep following up with one case over and over again. Honestly, say we still have a long way to go in terms of um, public perception. Um, so there was a case this year that went viral, which involved a known celebrity, uh, a musician to be, to be specific. And from that case, you could see a lot of people saying different things, judging the survivor, why were you there? How did you get a key to your room? So many things. We still don't understand the concept of um, consent and bodily autonomy, um, which, is, which is like the, the bedrock for addressing GBV. So there's a lot of work to be done um, in, in this space. There's a lot of advocacy to be done, a lot of policy adoption to be done. Let me give you, a, let me give you an example as to why this is important. So um, recently, there was a case of a, of a governor who reconciled a domestic violence abuse victim with a husband. And this is a state that has adopted the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act, which means on paper, they have the bill, but in practice, it's not functioning. You know, how does a criminal issue become a family or, or, or a social issue that is solved, quote unquote, by a governor? So there's a lot of work we still need to do um, to hold our leaders accountable in terms of responding faster to cases of sexual and gender-based violence, but importantly, creating a safe, um, safe space for women and girls in Nigeria. So looking at your work over the years, have you identified uh, specific regions in, say, Nigeria, uh, where this happens more, are some people more prone to it? And what are the demographics like? Um, so to be fair, rape happens equally in all of the um, geopolitical zones that we have in Nigeria. Of course, for some parts, like the northern Nigeria part, you may not hear a lot of cases because of you know, their culture, um, um, in terms of keeping quiet about things like this, which a lot of advocacy is going on um, to ensure that this stops. Um, but you would equally have the same number of um, cases in all parts of, of, of Nigeria, to be very fair. A lot of our cases, um, children and young people, Although we have women as well who have been raped, but if you look at the number of cases that we see on a daily basis or that we at STAIR have handled, it involves more children. Um, and I'm talking children from as young as four years old. Um, for some other organizations, they've dealt with um, children as young as three months old or six months old. So um, it's, it's terrible, actually for those who are in, in the grassroots because you have like a normalization of abuse in, in, in those settings where a man is justified to chastise his, his wife um, by beating her up, you know, as a means to correct her, you know. Um, yeah, so women in the grassroots have it worse, um, but you'll be surprised that even women in the urban areas don't have it any better. It's just that maybe they have a way of, you know, curtailing the situation or, thinking about what would the society say about me? I'm a societal lady. People hear that my husband is beating me. You know, what would that say about my family? Uh, but for women in the grassroots, you know, it's, it's more about, listen, I'm suffering, you know, just help me. So it's really, you know, women in the grassroots and children that we, we've attended to. Uh, with all your years in doing this and going forward, what is the one key thing that you would want to see change? In, in your fight to end rape in Nigeria? I think for me, I'd rather we focus more energy towards protection or prevention as against response. Um, response is great because you want to ensure that when someone is violated, um, they have like an outlet to get support. But for me, I'd rather a society where, you know, um, gender equality is not 
a forming idea or ideology. It's something that we understand and we live on a daily basis. And this will help so many other things, women's political participation, economic empowerment for women. You know, it's not just sexual violence. It's just understanding that women and men are equal um, humans, um, de deserving of equal opportunities, respect, dignity, and autonomy. Um, that's what I want to see um, in, in our fight to, to end rape, because if we can achieve that, then we can considerably um, reduce the number of you know um, violence that we that occurs either within families or even um, in, in society in general. Because I mean, what makes a man of thirty five year or um, thirty five years old rape a child of four years old? Like it 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 it, it doesn't make sense. It's just understanding that you know this is a crime and everybody deserves respect and nobody's body should be violated on under any circumstance. So that's really what I am. Um, I'm looking at, because if you talk about policies, we have them. If you talk about response system, maybe inadequate or not enough, but we still have something. If you talk about conviction, very low, but at least we still have something. So what is missing is the prevention in itself of, of sexual violence, or basically, let me frame it in three words that I like to use, improving knowledge on you know, um, the rights of each person to, to, to live free of abuse, changing practices that has promoted violence against women and girls and you know um, elevating attitudes that protect the rights of women and girls right i would like to say congratulations on the award and um if, if there's one thing you want to dedicate the award to what would that be um i think this this award i'd like to dedicate to yeah two people members of the feminist coalition and um all the staff and volunteers of Stand to End Rape Initiative. The first one, um, Feminist Coalition, I, I, am a, I am a part of, um, and it's a group of young women who are you know, fighting for better society for all persons, specifically for women and girls. And on so many occasions, you know, they always show up to support women's issues in Nigeria. So I'm grateful for them and I dedicate this award to them. Uh, the second, but not the least, is the staff and volunteers of STAIR. I mean, these are the backbone of everything that we do um, at STAIR. You know, um, they put in their time, their, you know, expertise, their resources, everything into the work that we do um, and do it as though they are doing it to themselves. And that for me is the most selfless service I have seen. So I dedicate this um, award to them because they are like a, uh, like an engine room for, for, for my advocacy. They support me, they, they show me what true leadership means. And I'm just grateful um, to, to be working with them. Thanks so much, Oluwa Shon. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you.